All right, we are now recording. If you're consenting to this, you can stay. If you're not, you can leave. So that out of the way. Um, so welcome everybody to our first meeting of 2021. We all survived. Um, <laughs> and uh, so we're here with Southwest Florida Sec and we meet the third Tuesday of every month at 6.30 p.m. and generally carry on uh, for a couple hours or further, depending on how long people want to stay afterwards. And right now we are meeting only vir virtually until I guess some more vaccinations get delivered. And maybe we'll consider finally getting to physical meetings again later this year, hopefully. Uh, and with that, we'll likely, I think as far as uh, success with this virtual meeting that we've had going on since about what, March or April, I think we switched over. Uh, we'll likely keep the virtual component moving uh, alongside. So we'll just do, I guess, simulcasting, if you will. Uh, between virtual and physical, we'll move over to physical. So in that way, uh, people like Tavin and Sai can continue to attend and, and we can have great um, people like Jonathan uh, stop by and, and give us talks about having to travel two and a half hours south. And <laughs> uh, but anyway, so uh, with that said, uh, the group meets uh, as a information security, cybersecurity uh, group here in Southwest Florida and we cover all kinds of topics uh, throughout the year and sometimes within a single meeting. And sometimes we'll have a, somebody come in and give us a presentation. Other times we'll just have a round table and uh, anybody can bring a topic to talk about, uh, bring questions to ask, and maybe somebody can, can help out with, with answering or, or ends up driving more conversation or you know, bring something into demo, uh, if, you, if you will, on the new most fancy toy or even an old toy because old exploits still work just as well as new exploits. Um, so uh, again, we're, we formed to try and raise awareness in the community and, and uh, we're getting there. Uh, the group has been growing. Uh, we're going on over a year and a half now. Our two years is coming up in June. So I wanna thank everybody for uh, continuing to come out to these meetings and put up with me here talking um, in front of the camera and, and physically when we were meeting physically. So I appreciate that. Uh, it shows that there is still an interest in the area um, in cybersecurity and and all the different facets of it, and it's it's so large that we can I mean we can never exhaust the topics, which is which is fantastic. And and I, I know out of this uh, meetup, we've been able to help people get jobs and get interviews and get skilled up. So that's been fantastic. And we're going to continue with that uh, mission of of not only driving awareness but providing uh, more training as we can throughout the community and. Um, you know, try and get into some different opportunities around here, which we'll talk about later. Uh, as well, we've also announced for those who haven't been on any of the meetings where we've announced this, we have announced that we are organizing uh, B-Sides Naples, the premier info information security uh, conference of the Paradise Coast to be tentatively run January, 2022. And uh, if you're interested in volunteering to help out with that, reach out to me uh, either the, in the chat on here, in our Slack or any other means that you have to to reach out to me, um, even carry your pigeon if you can find one. Uh, and then, um, yeah, it's gonna take a lot of effort. We have a year to organize. It should give us plenty of time. Uh, but as we all know, uh, for all of us who've been involved with projects, the time slips away very quickly. So uh, for those of you who have already reached out to, to volunteer, I think I do have you invited to our GitHub repositories for both the website and the uh, uh, private repository for our planning uh, and whatnot to carry out. Uh, if you haven't accepted that invite, please do so. They do expire. Uh, also be aware that the email link for some reason from GitHub doesn't work. Uh, so if you get an invite, you need to go to GitHub itself and accept that invite. I don't know why it doesn't work. Okay, so uh, in the area, the other thing we do is we also uh, work with all the other tech groups uh, as we can to cross promote with each other, uh, sometimes even co-host meetings uh, and just help uh, drive up technology uh, usage and education in the area. Uh, so with that said, uh, you can see here on the slide that we have uh, numerous groups and, and growing. I, I know I, I don't have a logo for a certain one, which we'll get to in a moment. Uh, it's not on here yet. And I think there's probably still more that, I, that I'm missing yet. So uh, with that said, we have Southwest Florida Coders. I don't know um, if we have Gina. Do you go to Southwest Florida Coders? I have not been in a while, so I, I would not be able to, but I am a member, yes. But I have not been to a meeting in a while. And I think, uh, Inessa, you go to the meetings occasionally. 
I think you're co-hosting soon, right? Yes, that's right. Uh, our next event is scheduled for Thursday, January 28th. Um, and um, uh, it's a co-hosted event uh, with Southwest Florida coders. So I'm not, uh, hello everyone, <laughs> those who haven't met me before virtually. Um, my name is Anessa Pawson and I'm the organizer of a Python user group and PyLadies chapter in Southwest Florida. Um, and uh, our next virtual event will be co-hosted with Southwest Florida coders as well as PyLadies Miami. Uh, I will leave uh, a link in the chat um, with more details about the upcoming event. Yes, please do. Uh, thanks, Inessa. So as, as Inessa mentioned, she's also uh, heading up PyLady Southwest Florida and, PyLady, and uh, I guess Python Southwest Florida. I don't, is that what it's called? That's right. We are, we are very new. Um, yes, just uh, launching um, at the next event officially. Um, I don't want to take up much time, but uh, uh, currently all our events are held virtually as well. Uh, and even though we look forward to meeting new friends in person, um, the advantage of virtual meetups is that we get speakers from all over the world. So uh, our next speaker is actually hailing from um, uh, New York City by way of the UK. Um, uh, will be will be a great event. I hope to see you there. Great. And do you want to give a quick blurb about uh, Alvis Code? Um, yes. Uh, I'm also an executive director of Alvis Code. Um, uh, we teach computer science at local schools and after school programs. Again, uh, currently it's all virtually. It's a uh, our target audience is uh, K-12 students. Uh, so if you have a student at home who is interested in computer science programming, or you think it would be great for them to, uh, to learn a little more about what, what it is, uh, we are starting our classes um, uh, next, uh, next month. Um, so please reach out and through social media. I'll also leave my email address uh, uh, in the chat and uh, I will send you more information about that. Great, thank, thank you. Thank you for the opportunity, Michael. Yes, of course. All right, uh, moving along, Southwest Florida Data. I saw Daniel join us. Daniel, if you want to give a quick uh, shout out for Southwest Florida Data as well as your new group that you're forming too. Yeah, sure, thanks. Um, yeah, the new group is still work in progress. I'm trying to uh, juggle a few things at a time, but Southwest Florida Data is a local technology group. We have also been meeting mostly online. The idea is to talk about different topics all related to data. So that makes it very broad intentionally, including things like data visualization, machine learning, and also data security in some instances where we have also uh, co-hosted with uh, Mike's group in the past. Uh, we have a meeting coming up on Monday, this upcoming Monday at 6.30 p.m. Uh, is uh, someone from GuardiCore, which is like a next, genera next generation firewall company is gonna talk about securing data flows um, in the cloud and on-premise. Uh, so feel free to check that out. And the new group uh, intention is to create a open source, uh, actively contributing open source community in the Southwest Florida area. So the idea is for uh, group members to kind of uh, come together and work towards uh, advancing specific open source projects um, to try to bring more attention to our area. Um, that is the initial intention. We'll see where it goes from there. But thanks, Mike, for the, for the opportunity. Yeah, you're welcome. All right, so going down the list, we have uh, OWASP Bonita Springs, which uh, we also run. And it meets. it was meeting monthly on the first Tuesday of each month. Um, we got started at the beginning of the pandemic lockdown, so we haven't had a lot of attendance with it yet. Uh, so that one we are going to move to quarterly for now until we can grow our attendance. Uh, and we're always looking also to co-host, so we're not stuck on quarterly, but uh, are willing to actually have ad hoc meetings as well under the OWASP uh, umbrella as we can. And then we have uh, BR and AR of Southwest Florida. I didn't see uh, Evie join, so um you can find uh, the organization on various social media platforms as well as meetup so look there to find out about any upcoming meetings if you're interested in vr and ar 
Uh, there's WordPress uh, Meetup in Southwest Florida as well. Uh, it looks like they're having a very large meeting coming where they're going to uh, cross meet with a variety of different other WordPress um, meetups, I guess, around the U.S., not just Florida. And I don't recall. I have to go back and look at the announcement. So if anybody's um, interested in WordPress, uh, head over on to their meetup. And then there's a Southwest Florida Regional Technology Partnership, uh, which is also helping uh, with uh, promoting technology in the area. And I don't know when their next event is. Uh, does anybody else on the call know? No. Okay. So, and, and like I said, there, there are a couple others. I think I'm forgetting. I think there's like a Bitco uh, Bitcoin cryptocurrency type uh, group in the area as well. And uh, I don't know, there, there, there could be others. So moving along, uh, upcoming events. Uh, you heard some of those already uh, for various different organizations in the area. Uh, I think all of us now have meetup pages and like I said, uh, as well as being on social media accounts. And then there is oh, the one I didn't have a logo for, uh, Sarasota InfoSec Community. I uh, didn't see John. No, John has not joined us tonight. So there's a Sarasota InfoSec Community. Uh, we try to uh, cross-organize with them so that we're not uh, on the same meeting date because they are kind of hitting a sweet spot for Southwest Florida as well, uh, where I think about where Shane is located is the halfway point. So from Port Charlotte south, it's easier to get to us. And from Port Charlotte northward, uh, it's easier, easier to go to Sarasota. So we try and, uh, as people reach out to, the, to our groups, uh, point them in, in those directions. Of course, we're welcoming to, to all. So if you want to make the drive, uh, come on down and, and see us and hang out with us uh, when we go physical. Otherwise, of course, with virtual, it doesn't matter where you are, uh, you can still join us. Uh, like I said, we are open to the public. And um, yeah, welcoming to everybody. And I think Sarasota is as well, you know, interacting with them. They're a great group. And um, I don't know when their next event is yet. So then there's the professional organizations in the area. Uh, ISSA, of course, South Florida chapter. Uh, they do have a meetup coming up on Thursday. I don't re remember the topic though. Uh, George, did you, do you remember the topic? I know you talked about potentially going. Okay, maybe not. All right, uh, let's just go ahead and look at their meetup page and their topic should be there now. Uh, of course, there's ISACA Southwest Florida, or not Southwest, not yet at least. Uh, there is ISACA Southwest Florida. Uh, again, theirs is to be determined. Check, they don't, I think, have a meetup page. So check out their chapter website for additional details. And with that, that moves us on, <clears throat> excuse me, that moves us on to the tell us your needs uh, section of the night. Uh, this is where we open the floor to everyone, uh, anybody who's looking to hire, uh, looking to be hired or has any other questions to post to the group, uh, this is your time to take the mic and ask away. Sure. So uh, I'll put myself out there. Uh, my name is Kevin Harrigan. I'm currently a uh, senior at Florida Gulf Coast University. Uh, I'm about to graduate after this spring with a degree in computer information systems. Uh, and I'm looking for an entry ro uh, level role uh, full time in information security. Uh, I've been fortunate enough uh, at this point to work an IT internship. Uh, where the majority of my work has been on the GRC side of information security. So doing uh, IS risk work, I've done some IT auditing work, uh, things of that nature. Uh, but I'm also looking for some experience on the operational side of things. Uh, so if anybody uh, you know or you yourselves have uh, open entry level positions and that you would like to fill, uh, please feel free to reach out uh, or connect me uh, on LinkedIn. You can just look up Kevin Harrigan Jr. and you can find me. Thanks, Mike. Thanks, Kevin. And when do you graduate? Uh, I graduate May 21, May 1 of 21, coming up fast. Um, All right, fantastic. Appreciate it. Thank you. Sure. Hey, Shane, go ahead. Hey, so uh, we are still looking for a fundraiser for the Innocent Lives Foundation. If you know anyone who's got uh, three years or more of experience, um, that uh, has a history of raising a million dollars plus. We'd love to talk to them. Thank you. Great. Thanks, Shane. All right. Anybody else need to um, ask questions, make a request? All right. I'll just give a quick shout out for my own employer. I know uh, most of you know I work for a medical device company here in Southwest Florida named Arthrex. Uh, if you go to careers.arthrex.com, there are several developer positions open. Uh, some do have the remote capability as well. 
We're also looking to hire several more business analysts, uh, project management, and uh, let's see. I think I'm missing, Michelle, am I missing anything else? George, Michelle and George, because I'm gonna call them out. No, nothing for our team at this point. We have to break our new director in once he arrives next week. So I think it'll be like 60 to 90 days before they uh, look at possibly hiring new folks. Yeah. So nothing official, but pretty soon. All right. So you heard it here first. Keep an eye out on the <laughs> careers.arthrex.com page for not only the open positions that are there now and the different technology groups, um, but potentially upcoming changes in the security group that's going to drive a need for additional headcount. All right. So thanks, everyone, for your requests and questions and announcements. We're going to move on to our presentation of the night. Uh, we're welcoming Jonathan Singer from up north, but still in Florida. The Florida man himself, John, I'm going to move over hosting to you. You can take it over. Very cool. Thank you, Mike. All right. Oh, look at that. I'm the host now. All right. We're going to test out an awesome new feature of Zoom. So let's, uh, we were testing it earlier and it worked the way I expected. So please be prepared, everybody. Watch. Taking this. a ride. Yeah, we're going on a wild ride, I promise. All right, it's loading up and wow, it worked. Look at that, that's cool. I'm down here. All right, so um, first off, hello everybody. Uh, I want to make this a very open discussion in the sense that you can yell out anything anytime you can um, interrupt me, you can pose a question, you can make a comment, you can tell me your password, uh, whatever you would like to do uh, at any time during this discussion uh, is, is perfectly acceptable. Uh, I take no offense to any of that stuff. Um, uh, unless you give me your password, then I'll be very upset. So uh, with that in mind, uh, thank you, Mike, for inviting uh, me to present at this evening's um, online virtual uh, event. Uh, I will be presenting on the fun discussion topic of SIMS and logging and big data and all that other cool stuff. And, um, and so just to kind of keep everybody uh, engaged and involved, um, you know, does, is everybody already kind of familiar with uh, SIMS in by any chance? Uh, how about this? If you haven't heard of a SIM or if you're not currently using a SIM, go ahead and raise your hand or I don't know how we virtually participate these days. Cool. Oh yeah, look at that. There's a little thing of raising hands. Okay, so so we have a couple people that are are, are that are new to this topic. That's fantastic. Fantastic. Okay, great. Um uh look look at all these these uh, wonderful individuals getting ready to learn some something new here. Uh, and and strange enough, uh, whatever part of the industry you're in, this is still going to be relevant to you in some way, some form. Uh, and so with that, uh, let's go ahead and begin. Uh, so uh, the agenda is uh, we're, we're only going to do like the top five. Don't worry about the bottom three. Uh, it's just for the sake of it, because this is a deck that I use for some other things. Well, so who am I, right? Why do I get to be on webcam and, and share this wonderful stuff? Um, and we'll talk about some introductory information and, and the history and background of logging. I find that foundational information and, um, you know, understanding where things came from is extremely important because that uh, definitely explains uh, how we got to where we're at today and maybe even potentially where we're going with it. And then we'll talk a little bit about the need for SIMS and the concepts of big data. Now, um, Splunk, we'll, 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 I'll tell more about what that means and other weird things, but let's, let's talk about SIMS and big data. So who am I? Uh, my name is Jonathan Singer, and I do a lot of things. I, I do a lot of stuff. Uh, I work at uh, GuidePoint, and my day job is Splunk and Sims. Uh, so if you have any uh, questions about any of that, uh, you are more than welcome to ask me at the end. But for now, I've got my bachelor's and master's, both from Florida universities in IT and the cybers. Um, and I'm involved in lots of projects. I love working on different things. For instance, uh, up here in Tampa, I'm the co-lead for our OWASP chapter. Uh, I'm a B-Sides Orlando founder, uh, Cigar City Sec, and uh, also uh, up in Tampa, and also Citrus Sec over in Orlando founders. 
Um, and I am a goon at DEF CON. So if you are in Las Vegas, um, uh, say hello. I wear a red shirt. I yell at people, uh, but it's out of love. Um, and then, you know, I've graduated from some other stuff too. Uh, so that's, that's what I do. Uh, it's, it's a really good time. So, uh, so let's, let's talk about first things first. Uh, I need to, to do this more like as a, as a functional thing. Uh, Splunk is not a sim. So I'm going to take my Splunk hat off and uh, toss that off to the side. So uh, Splunk is what I do for a living, but this talk, I don't want it to be about Splunk. I want it to be more generalized. And for those that are not familiar with what Splunk is, um, it's basically what we're going to talk about. It's one of the many tools in this uh, variety of data. So again, uh, those of you that are Splunkers, uh, I'm sorry to hurt your feelings. So anyways, back in the good old days in the advent of time, right? When um, Cray computers and uh, dinosaurs roamed the earth with the never finishing Orlando projects. Um, uh, there, there was this, this concept of, I have too many computers. Uh, not really a problem to have, if you ask me, but for some people, apparently it is. And so they had way too many computers and, and the, all of these computers had data on them. And, and so uh, what, what do you do with all of this data, right? Um, it, it, we were we were just kind of coming up on the advent of of really you know serious networking and bringing computers together and the internet was still in its infancy and uh, and and sending data across the internet wow you know that's that's kind of a big deal right we're talking talking back in the in the day uh, here stuff and so all of these systems had uh, lots of logs on them right they had all of these. Uh, uh, actions, things were constantly happening. Every time you perform an action on a computer, no matter what it is, a log is created of that event, right? So let's say you log into your computer. There's a log of that and it literally says whatever username logged into the computer, right? And so for every action and every event that you do on a system, um, it creates this little entry in a journal, like a little, just a list, and it just adds a new line right underneath it and the next action you did and the next action you did. Um, and so, so computers have been doing this for a long time, this concept of logging uh, and keeping track of what's going on uh, has, has been very important. It's been critical for debugging. It's been critical for understanding the stepping process of a program or an application. Um, you know, again, everything is constantly generating this data. It's making a list of all of the different things that you're doing. And so for a long time, all of these isolated computers kept their logs to themselves. They kind of just stored it in a little file on their system and it just continued to grow and grow and grow. And if you ever needed to kind of look back and see what was happening on that system, you'd have to go directly to that system and you'd have to say, okay, let me get on this box. Let me get on this server and take a look at those log files and filter through it, right? And that's great, you know, if you only have maybe one or two computers, uh, but what if you're in a data center, right? What if you're in a server farm of hundreds or thousands of computers, right? Before the cloud was called the cloud, we used to just call it somebody else's data center. And they had thousands of computers. And if I needed to debug or diagnose something, I had to go to that exact box and figure out what was going on. And therein lies the problem. So this is when something amazing happened. The syslog protocol was brought to light. And this was designed um, in the uh, 80s. And yes, I'm calling you out, uh, Mr. Uh, was that Kevin? This is before you were born. So, uh, so basically, the idea here is that um, a computer is perfectly capable of utilizing the fact that it's on a network and, and, and can communicate and see with other computers. So why don't we figure out a way to also maybe offload some of our logging from that concept of isolation and send it over to maybe one computer to handle it all in one easy to review place, like, to, to, like a journaling computer, a logging computer of some sort that centralized it. And so the SendMail team, a very, very, very cool program of the ancient Unix days. Um, uh, this, I mean, this is literally how we used to send email back in the day uh, with, a, with a terminal. And we used a program called SendMail. 
and we typed our email as text and we hit send and it blasted across our ISDN if we were lucky prior dial up connections and it landed in somebody else's uh, server, right? Um, and this isn't about email, but the SendMail team um, was the ones who, who really designed the concept of syslog um, as a protocol. They said, look, we, we think that this is useful and we generate data and uh, we, it would be fantastic. And suddenly all these other application developers in the Unix era of the 80s saw what the syslog development team was doing and, and they said, well, well we want to participate in syslog too. We love the fact that your application um, isn't just capable of generating log data for debugging and figuring out what's going on, but you're also capable of sending it off and shipping it off to another system. That, that's fantastic. That makes things so easy. Uh, so they started adopting this concept of syslog within their applications. And before we know it, it has become the standard across all of these uh, Unix and now starting to become Linux operating systems of, of uh, you know, okay, uh, we all generate data. Let's all start, you know, using a, a fairly simple standard of, of how we just transmit that data for easy, you know, review and debugging purposes. And, and, you know, what's strange actually is that, is that this became so common and, and almost like kind of like a, a spoken standard in itself that it was just the assumed de facto for many years, right? Everybody just assumed, oh, well, do you support syslog? Because I support syslog in my application. And the crazy thing is it didn't even get documented into an RFC, right? Uh, a request for comments. It's these, these published the standards of the internet, right? Uh, if you ever feel like reading RFCs, they're fantastic reads. And, um, and, and, but it wasn't even until 2001 that the first documented RFC of the syslog protocol or like even came up, right? So for almost two decades, computer software was using a spoken uh, amongst developer standard uh, so much so that people just assumed, oh, you know, I'm, I'm following the standard, but it was actually never really published in, until then. And then finally, it, was, it wasn't just documented in 2001, it was finally standardized in a following RFC. And so, um, it, you know, it, it, it's really incredible that when developers get together, they're capable of, of really changing the way the internet works and setting the, the pavement and the groundwork for, uh, for, for, you know, how we operate in cybersecurity uh, today. So, so this is very important to understand where the concept of, of what we're getting into even comes from. And so, so let's, let's continue to dive in and, and dig into this. So, so the syslog protocol, right? What they wanted to do is they wanted to find a way of saying, okay, I have to get data from many, many, many computers to maybe like one or two computers. Um, how do we do this, right? What, what, how, what is this logical design architecture gonna look like? And so several different variations as shown here on the screen in the finest of ASCII art um, is, is how data is transmitted, right? And so you have your device, which is your host, and you have your collector, which is your server, and we can send it directly. Uh, but what if we can't? What if there's something in the way of a network? Well, we can relay it. Okay, great. Well, well, what if there's more, more difficult things? And we can multiple relay it. Okay, great. Well, what if I need a backup of it? Well, then we can split it in multiple directions and, and so on, as you see where I'm going with this. And if you, if you have any background in enterprise IT or networking, and you, you're probably starting to think, okay, I see where they're going with this. This is basically how a standard SIM works today. So, what I'm basically saying is the technology of a standard SIM today is based off of a 40 year old uh, ASCII art diagram as shown here on the screen. So welcome to the internet. Um, so, so now that we understand that we, we can relay data and we can clone data and we can send it in multiple directions and, and kind of flip it up this way and send it off that way, uh, let's, let's talk about like, you know, Okay, great. So what are we doing here? And so centralized logging, this concept of centralized logging is born and it is embraced, right? Why do we care about centralized logging? Well, first off, like I said, we want to collect those logs from all these different systems to bring them into one central location, right? And that has so many benefits. Like I'm only thinking of a couple, but like I can go on for hours 
theoretically of all the different reasons why you would want to bring all of your logs into one centralized location, right? The easiest one, let's storm for long term and save space on a host. Now, let's dial it back here and go back to the 80s again. How big was a hard drive? You know, 100 megabytes, maybe less, much less. So space on a computer was very expensive, right? We don't have these magical two terabyte NVMe SSDs uh, that we can just toss around these days, okay? Um, hard drives were, were, were massive, right? I'm talking the size of a toaster and they were very expensive and didn't store a lot of data in at least in relative terms for today. And so you wanted to not fill it up with all of this log data. We wanted to shift it off onto a specialized system that had more enterprise storage and make sure that host didn't fill up its drive on accident, all right? The other thing is that it's so much easier to, uh, like I mentioned, go to one computer to find all this data instead of having to actually go to every single server. Now, when I worked in a data center in Orlando many, many moons ago, we used to have this thing called a crash cart. You may ask, crash cart? That sounds dangerous in a data center. Well, it is. It's a cart with a monitor, a keyboard, and a mouse. And you would wheel it down the aisle to the server you were trying to service, and you'd plug in the monitor and plug in the keyboard and pull up the screen and log in and then pilfer whatever data you needed to review. Why did the server crash? Why is the application not responding? No, 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 no. Let's get into the logs and see what's going on here. As fun as that was, um, that was just extremely inefficient. It required a human being to get up and run around a data center and we had the hot aisle, we had the cold aisle. Um, it, it was just, you know, you can only work on one system at a time, right? If somebody else needed the crash cart, they had to ask very nicely. So uh, it, it was really cool. Um, and, and yeah, getting your steps in, I totally agree, Link. So, so it was crazy. Um, and so we can bring these all together into one place and we can quickly search across those logs from different systems. So let's say I wanted to search when a user logged into any of the systems. Well, then it was simple as saying, well, then show me all of the activity for user John Smith and all of them. And then boom, I got results. I had instant results from multiple different systems um, and just efficiency went through the roof, right? We're talking, I mean, this is just a couple of these great examples, right? And, I, and, and, and from a security perspective, like maybe if I wanna look for a user across my environment or an IP address and find out how many systems that IP is connected to, right? There were so many fundamental uses uh, that, that this, this centralized logging concept um, is, is doing for us. Now, I thought of one even earlier today to add to this slide. Uh, what if the system that you need the logs from crashed? What if the hard drive corrupted? What if it was hacked and all of the logs were deleted? Well, by offloading them to another system, you have a backup of that data. You have somewhere that you can review that information. What if that system is no longer physically accessible for some reason, right? And it was damaged. So there's a lot of really great, you know, opportunities here of why you should be doing this. And so to that point, if your organization is not currently doing this, uh, we need to talk. So. Uh, let's talk about uh, things that, uh, that, that syslog and, and sending data is, is all about, just to kind of lay some more premise about this, right? Now, again, uh, you do not, and I mean this, do not want to accidentally fill up the logging server in itself, right? Because we already warned about the host filling up, but what if your logging server fills up? Then it can't receive any more data. Uh, that makes for a more interesting uh, scenario. Uh, these are more tips and tricks for the, uh, the, the young folks. Um, the other one too is syslog is primarily based on UDP, and I'm not going to tell any jokes about UDP because uh, I don't want I, I don't know if you're going to get them, but um, but still, the, the you know uh, if a UDP what it basically implies thank you what it basically implies is that uh, the packet is kind of just sent on the hopes that it makes it to its destination. Uh, and if the destination, like the logging system is down, the, the packet kind of fizzles away in your network. So, uh, so you want to make sure that the, the communication between uh, who's sending the logs and who's receiving it is, is well established uh, and, and without any kind of uh, fault. Uh, it hit you a little late, it's okay. Um, again, stuff like network congestion can, can really get into the way of this. And, and then 
Um, I'm a big uh, proponent of the poor configuration leads to poor performance. So, um, you know, read the documentation and make sure that you're setting these kind of things up effectively. Um, and uh, I think the biggest kind of flaw or the biggest problem when it comes to centralized logging is that people just don't do anything with the information, right? You, you can't sit here and complain that you have a problem with something or a server's slow or an application's not responding uh, or there's some kind of issue. Uh, if you're not actively looking at the logs and you're monitoring this stuff and you're making sure that things are healthy, right? Uh, I, so many times I see organizations and they're just like, let's collect all the data, bring it all together. And I go, great, what's your plan to review and audit this information? And they go, we need to look at it and audit it and review it. And then, you know, they realize that there's actually a responsibility in the ownership of data. So fun thing, but do not, um, don't, don't just like collect things for the sake of collecting it. Like there's a lot of rich information in uh, logs and in data from, from these different systems that uh, you can, you can kind of make it a, a year round exercise to uh, track down hackers and, and things like that, or identify problems. Um, th there also gives you the opportunity to automate some of this and we'll, we'll get into that, but keep in mind that data is valuable. Um, you don't want it to get in the hands of, of bad people, uh, but you do want to use it uh, to improve your organization. So, so let's talk about uh, what, what a log file is. Like what, what, what is this data I keep talking about? Um, and, and so we, we tail these logs. Oh, what the heck does tail mean even, right? And so, so like I mentioned, uh, computer's constantly generating a journal of all the things that it does. And, and it just adds a new line every single time. And so your computer is very chatty. It's very, very, very talkative. It's, it's constantly smashing the keyboard, Eric. And um, it's, it, it, it's doing all these things. And so, so when we, we, what we talk about is when I say the word tail or tailing, tail refers to a, a, a command. And that idea is, okay, okay, well then let's just continue to read with the file. Let's roll with it. As a new log entry is written to it, let's, let's read from it. Let's, let's continue to, to work with it. And, uh, and so that's what we're doing here is we're monitoring these log files in the system for new entries and we're, we're shipping them off as soon as the new entry is written. Right, and so we're we're, mon we're we're actively viewing here, and so that's the concept of how this whole system works. Is data is generated in one place, we're we're keeping an eye on it, and then anything new, we're sending it off. So, uh, so so back in the day, we used to literally do it like that. Actually, I just want to make this. This is how I read logs. Like I would pull up the file in a terminal, and I would sit there line by line and go, nope, nope, nope. Oh, there it is. That's what I'm looking for. Uh, but we have we have tools, right? Things are growing, things are improving. We have applications now. Suddenly, you don't need to sit in a terminal anymore. You can use a web browser. Yeah, grep. Grep is how I used to do everything. And for those that aren't familiar with grep, uh, check it out. It is the original search engine way before Google. So, um, and technically, fun fact, Yandex is before Google, but that's neither here nor there. Um, so, uh, so, so, so we used to we used to work in a terminal and then look for all these things, and now we can do it in a web browser, and we can we can search quickly using our mouse. Uh, I am a I don't like that. I'm I'm such an old school Linux terminal fan that I always say the the less mouse you use, the better you are at the computer, and. Uh, so, so, but, but we're getting there, we're getting better. And people are actually starting to adopt this concept of, of syslog and centralized logging that they've almost gotten to the point where it's not just like an open source thing anymore from a bunch of Unix developers. Uh, it's really embraced and it's really starting to take off. And, and companies are starting to get built uh, around the concept of centralized logging. And they're saying, how do I make this more accessible? How do I make this smarter? How do I make this easier? How do I make this, you know, uh, better uh, from a visualization perspective, right? How do I visualize my data? How do I PowerPoint it, right? Or whatever people do these days. So, so we're, we're growing in time, as you can see here, we're, we're now, um, you know, expanding through the decades. Um, uh, really important for distributed applications, the cloud containers, other buzzwords. Yes, clouds and and distribution and whatever. Like it's there's there's an entire industry around this stuff that's taking off, and it's extremely impressive um, having come so far from uh, it's just its roots of of a Unix uh, idea. So so. 
we reach the past decade uh, ago, right? Uh, not even, about 15 years ago. And, and the security information and event management system is built, the SIM, right, uh, for short. And, and this is, uh, I call it security, uh, centralized logging with a security twist, right? Uh, which is really cool because we've, we've thrown smarts at those logs. Uh, it, it, is, it is at the advent of, of what we're capable with technology prior to the ML AI movement. There's your buzzwords, uh, machine learning. Uh, so so it, it take, it's real-time analysis uh, of security alerts generated by these applications and systems and networking and stuff like that. Uh, it's the capability of saying, hey, computer robot, when you see this in the logs, let me know, right? Uh, again, for, for those old school fans, we used to call those Perl scripts, but, uh, but for the, the, the new folks in town, uh, welcome to a sim, right? And so Shane, I, I, I hope you're loving where this is going. I can see I'm getting a lot of laughs out of you. <laughs> so uh, yeah, PCRE, Perl Compatible Regular Expressions. Um, so in fact, uh, secret sims are built on PCRE. Don't tell anybody. So um, uh, so, so this this new generation of centralized logging software has really started to take off in, in the past decade and a half or so. In fact, Gartner decided to get a jump in on the bandwagon and coin the term. Um, and so, so things have been things have been taken off since then, uh, and it, it's super cool. And so that brings us to what we're talking about today. Uh, you can oh the magic quadrant. Yes, uh, we all love the magic quadrant. So. So that, that really brings us what we wanted to kind of cover today is the SIM, right? And, and so I've taken the past 20 minutes to take you down this historical adventure road of, of just understanding how we got to where we're at today. And so let's, let's focus on then what is the modern SIM? What should you expect out of a modern SIM, right? What, it, what does it do for your organization, right? Um, and so, so what does a SIM do, right? It, it, it's, got, it's not just a way to quickly search through all of the different logs of your systems. I mean, it is that, uh, but it does so much more, right? It, we can do that event searching, uh, but we can do reporting, right? Reporting is great for business folks, right? So um, dashboards and pretty graphs, right? I, I told you we, we've taken it to the next step is that we wanna visualize our data and we wanna show pie charts and trends and spark lines and swim lanes and all that other fun stuff, right? Um, one of those key things uh, is correlating across multiple different data sources. So what if you wanna track an IP address across your network, but not all of the logs are the same type of log? What if you wanna track an IP in a Windows log and you also wanna track it on a Palo Alto firewall and you also wanna track it on a Cisco VPN Right? And so uh, SIM allows you to, to normalize all the data across these different sources and, um, and uh, be able to search across them regardless of where they came from. Right? Uh, something we covered a little bit earlier is log retention and cycling. Oftentimes you'll find that your organization is tied to compliance and regulatory uh, needs. And they will blatantly say, you need to have logs from your systems for one year. You need to be able to go back and from one year from today or whatever that point at time we requested is historically and be able to show us the logs and be able to review that data. And, and so you can tell the sim, well then keep logs for a year. After a year, purge them, right? Uh, and so that's a very important topic too. Alerting and notifications. Uh, we all love getting woken up in the middle of the night uh, by X Matters and PagerDuty, but the, the reality of it is, is when a critical infrastructure, um, you know, alert or a notification is triggered by a SIM, uh, we need to know about these things. And so we can, again, tell the robot computer, hey, listen, when you see this, let me know. When you see this, just send me an email, right? Um, and uh, Mike, you're, you're, you're getting a little head there, uh, but I, I, will, I will get to that point. Um, and then, uh, 
uh, device monitoring too is another big thing, right? Device health, uh, constantly uh, computers spitting out all this metrics and it's saying my CPU utilization is this, my memory utilization is this, my hard drive free space is this, right? And so you can do device and host monitoring with a SIM and you can monitor the health of these devices and you know their, their uptime and their, their online status. And it ultimately you can start to predict like, you know, if CPU goes high and, and memory goes high and hard drive starts to really fill up, that's it. Sounds like a crash is going to happen sometime soon. So you can you can even predictively prevent uh, outages by looking at the symptoms, right? So cool stuff. Get your kind of hamster spinning. Um, and then did I did I mention meeting compliance? I don't know. I just like to bring that up all the time because it's really important for some reason. So um, so let's, so so these are the things that uh, these are things that. Some of the just basic things that you would expect out of a sim and what they're going to do in a, in a modern time, right? And and but let's really get into it. Like, why do you and your organization, maybe not so you as an individual, um, but your organization, why does your company need a sim, right? Uh, compliance told you so, um, and it's not just any compliance. If you have socks, right, so Rains Oxley, and you're publicly traded, compliance. Um, if you have to do FISMA, compliance. If you have to do PCI and credit cards and HIPAA and FERPA and ISO 27001, compliance. Um, where are my auditors at? Uh, you know, it, this is generally the easiest reason you'll find yourself um, having some kind of SIM within an organization because it's a need, not a want, uh, and you need to have it because of these. So cool stuff with that. Um, now, uh, let's say you're running a SOC, right? And you want pretty graphs on the wall. Well, how else do you get pretty graphs? From your data. So a sim uh, will be able to give you pretty graphs uh, like this picture shown here. This is not any one particular place. This is Google Images. So don't think there's anything valuable in here. Um, and, and one of the cool things, right, um, is, is kind of think, think like power plant, right? Um, when you imagine what the inside of a power plant monitoring room is, it's got buttons and dials and, and pretty lights and information, right? And, and so what it's doing is it's bringing all that vital information of, of all the different components around the power plant into one centralized place. And so it gives you that single pane of glass to monitor all of your data and monitor all of your events, regardless of the origin of it, regardless of the type of data. Um, again, SIMS are going to normalize that. And it's going to make sense of that. Um, and and uh, just to remind everybody, you know, we we do care about security still. So uh, this this really helps with it. Um, uh, I see a uh, question from George. Uh, in your opinion, what is the ratio uh, 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 two of full-time employees and logs per second when it comes to building a SOC and managing a SIM 24-7, any golden rules? Uh, That's a great question. And um, and George, we will, uh, let's address that towards the end I'm, uh, in a couple minutes here. And we'll talk about how staffing um, works, right? And and utilization and, and eyes on glass, right? That, that buzzwords for days. So, um, so let's talk about this. Software is not cheap. Sims have their own Gartner quadrant. They're an industry. There's money in this. There's millions. There's billions. They're publicly traded at this point. Um, and so what can you do if you are broke um, or you have uh, no budget or your uh, executive team tells you that there's no ROI in security? Um, well, I mean, they're not wrong, but uh, it's, it's risk. So it's all about calculated measured risk. Uh, free alternatives, right? Free uh, uh, is is stuff like Elk Stack and Elastic. And yes, I know Elk is going through a big transition right now. Um, uh, Alienware, maybe even to a little bit, but uh, just go with it. We'll talk about it. Um, Syslog itself, like Syslog is still a thing. Like you can still run Syslog. Like that, that's perfectly acceptable. Many systems still do. Um, Kiwi is a pretty cool little tool that can read Syslog stuff for Windows. Um, and technically Splunk makes a free version. Uh, it's got a lot of limits, but it works. Uh, also technically, um, uh, Humio has a free version. Uh, none of these are really Sims, like, cause they don't have all the smarts. They're just a centralized logging tool. Uh, but let's talk about where the money's at, right? This column right here, commercial, uh, HP's ArcSight, right? And 
Exabeam and Logarithm and Sumo Logic and McAfee Nitro and Q, IBM Q Radar and Splunk Enterprise Security and many more. There's there's a ton of sims these days, and they're all um, you know claiming all kinds of interesting things. Um, for the most part, they all really do a lot of the same stuff, right? Uh, just different ways of approaching some of the different challenges. Um, and if you have any of these, great. If you have any of the free ones, uh, that's a start. If you have nothing at all, again, we need to talk. Um, so uh, just it, it's it, there's a lot, uh, a lot of options, uh, and you know, trying to determine what's best for your organization uh, is just kind of like a discussion you should definitely have with like a trusted advisor or some kind of consulting agency. Um, you know, you can try to do some of the research yourself, but it's really hard to read through the lines on like a vendor website. It's all just sales buzz stuff. So um, let's talk about that data retention policy, right? Because uh, I, I love audits, right? And, and compliance. Uh, I don't know why, but I do. And, uh, and so, so just some things that you want to consider, right? Um, as, as a security person or as some kind of person within an organization that actually cares, uh, is you have to understand what are the rules that you're trying to abide by, right? And, and I mentioned earlier, like compliance is very important, right? The compliance will make you need it, not want it. Um, and so what exactly does it say, right? So in PCI uh, in 10.7, right? In, in section 10.7, not version, because it's not that high. Um, it, it's very specific, it's, it's very simple. Retain an audit trail for at least one year. With three months of that one year, the first three must be immediately available. That means you can take nine months and compress it and archive it off to somewhere else and just know that you need to, un you can unarchive it later if you need. So at least they understand like the necessity of compression and like saving money um, and things like that. But PCI luckily is still very, very specific, right? Um, not all compliance is that clear cut though. Like look at 27,001 for instance, right? We need you to just log stuff to be able to view it regularly. Well, how long do I need to keep it for? Um, somebody give me some guidance. Like, is it like my, you know, taxes? Do I need to keep them for seven years? I don't know if that's still a rumor or not, but um, the point is, is uh, some compliance are going to be very clear cut to the point and you'll know exactly what your expectations are. And you either, it, it's, you know, it's bullying. You meet them or you don't. Uh, and other ones, it's all about interpretation. Uh, so please be careful when it comes to reviewing your compliance and regulatory needs when it comes to SIMS and centralized logging. Uh, and if you need any help with that, also please feel free to say hi at the end. So um, now that we're really starting to get into the game here, uh, which is like, okay, my organization is cloud adverse or my organization's cloud forward, uh, or I have things in the cloud. Do I need to run a SIM in the cloud or can I run it back at my data center if I'm hybrid, right? And like, what does all this mean for my company? Um, and there's different ways of, of, of like looking at this, right? Because SIMs, um, some of them are uh, specific to clouds. Some of them are specific to on-prem. Some of them are hybrid, support both, right? And so a lot of that also comes down to consideration and discussion when you're talking about a SIM within your organization, right? And so, when we're talking about on-premise, right? You're responsible for the system that it's deployed on and the virtual hosts and the data center and the network. And you have to be the admin, you have to be the foundation um, and, and you have to make sure that those systems stay online and are accessible, right? And so are, is that something you're capable of doing? Uh, are you working with a CapEx you know, budget and you just have servers laying around, right? Um, versus, are you prepared to begin with a SIM in the cloud, right? Uh, it is hosted elsewhere, right? Is it within the United States or is it outside of the United States? And does my data leave the United States? Is that something that you're required to stick to or are you allowed to, right? Um, uh, let's see here. Uh, let's see, uh, uh, but it is not specific on what to collect though. It says collect logs from all the payment systems, but what is missing? Yeah, there it's you, it's, it's really difficult to, to interpret and read. And it's crazy that, uh, like you said, you, you, you need to figure out how to pass that audit. And uh, because it's vague, the, it's up to the auditor at that point. I can, it, it's, it's really crazy how some of this stuff works. Um, and so, so very good point, uh, Sia. It, uh, you know, when they're vague like that, you, you kind of just got to go with your best effort. You got to ask a lot of questions. Um, 
But back to it. So when we're talking in the cloud, it, it, you know, where's my data? Where's it hosted? Does it ever traverse the country in and out of the country, right? Uh, the costs are bundled in, right? So maybe you're not buying a server, but you're still paying for it somehow. Um, it's web access in, in, in most cases. Um, and uh, and that's your only perspective. You don't see it from the operating system level. Um, and uh, But one of the, the benefits is you don't need to have as many people, right? Because the, the foundation is abstracted away from you and all you're responsible for is the presentation um, layer. And um, it, it, it definitely will, will take a lot of that effort off of your shoulders. So if you are limited in staff, um, or if you're limited in competent stuff, um, this, uh, you know, laying a lot of that responsibility uh, uh, to somebody else is maybe beneficial to you. So a lot of different con configurations, a lot of different considerations. Um, and uh, yeah, there's, there's all different types of, of different things that, that pop in. Um, and so just, again, this, the, we can keep these discussions up for, for all long last time. Uh, sorry about that. But uh, so let's talk about sizing, right? You, you want to you want to keep this in house. You want to figure out what it takes, right? And and let's just say you want to run it on prem. Like you, you need to understand data is data is massive, right? And so I, I give this example of of a hundred gigabytes a day, right? And you may say hundred gigs a day, like what is who downloads a hundred gigs a day? Well, first off, if you've ever watched a streaming service like Netflix, uh, you will easily do 100 gigs a day. But um, but the, the idea is, is the average Windows server generates 250 megabytes. I said that 250 megabytes of data per day and logging, right? Windows is a snitch. And, um, and so it's very easy to suddenly scale up. So this small enterprise of 400 Windows hosts there's your 100 gigs a day. Like that's, that's not too hard to get to. Now there's a little bit of compression. So we're really about 170 gigs a disk, right? And we need to keep them for a year. So to do some numbers, carry the two, 26 terabytes of logs on an annual basis. Uh, it suddenly got really expensive and it suddenly got really real, right? Do you understand what it takes to traverse 26 terabytes of data for an IP address. Okay, so SIMs are pretty pretty amazing technology when it really comes down to it and the capabilities uh, that and just modern hardware and technology and good processors these days. Um, and so you need to invest in, in a RAID array and, and have redundancy and SANs and, uh, and, and all this really expensive network equipment. And don't get me wrong, uh, I still install these things too. Um, yeah, put Sysman on it, man, that's, you know, EDR data is a whole nother level. Uh, backup, yeah, that's, yeah, this is just a, a production environment. What about your test, your uh, dev environment, right? And then what about staging, right? And then what about failover uh, and HA, right? So we're talking a lot of data here and a lot of computer systems. Um, you know, it's, it's really incredible what goes into a SIM and, and how it's, uh, you quickly forget uh, the effort that goes into this technology. Um, and so let's talk about the big uh, data elephant in the room, which is, is what does this have to do with big data and why should I even care? And so let's just make like a clear cut definition here. Right? You need to understand what big data even means. Um, and, and we want to be able to analyze information from a large data set, right? Uh, efficiency and speed is key, right? And, um, but big data is still... Uh, functional data. So, so maybe we're getting up to the terabytes, but we're not in petabytes and exabytes. It becomes so much data that we don't. We it becomes unfunctional. Um, and so, so this this infograph kind of gives us the perspective, right? We have the velocity, the volume, and the variety, right? And we want to be able to to get it quickly um, and effectively, and we want to be able to have a lot of it, but it needs to be a serviceable and functional amount. Um, and uh, uh, I see some questions about drill down of costs. Um, 
yes, we'll save that to the end. Uh, and then we have the variety, right? What can I store, right? Uh, I, so far, I've only been talking about logging data, but what about videos? What about uh, pictures, right? Uh, we can use OCR, right? Um, recognition, object uh, recognition to read a document and, and extract all the text out of that document uh, and, and add that to our archive, right? And so there's, there's all this different stuff uh, that we're working with. So, so keep that in mind when we're talking about big data and what it really means and, and the usefulness of big data versus some of the other things. Um, and, then, and then we get into the other magical words, right? We have stuff like data lake and data warehouse um, uh, and uh, value. Yes, Eric, there is, uh, there's massive value. Um, and so, so what's the difference between a data lake and a data warehouse? And why should I care within my organization, right? And so data lake is gonna be kind of that, that undefined reason. We just, just, we're just throwing it there. We'll put it, uh, and we'll, we'll, you know, it's just in its like raw form. Um, and, and more or less, this is like your, your data science. It's, it's kind of just, we're just like dumping it in there. Like we're just, just literally just dumping it like the tubes of an internet. And um, uh, in Florida, yes, we have the very rare and ha very highly sought after data swamp. Uh, it is, it is uh, just uh, northeast of uh, Naples. Uh, just, just keep driving, you'll, you'll end up in the data swamp. <laughs> and, uh, uh, but versus like a data warehouse, right? Uh, the, that's a bit of a different term. Uh, the warehouse is more of a predefined reason, right? This is processed and ready to query. This is data that is used by business professionals, right? It is mature data, it is ready, it is it's ready to be analyzed, right? And so again, we wanna make sure when you're having these conversations in your enterprise, you understand what all these different you know, areas mean, right? Um, yeah, we, we, there's, there's a lot of data lakes in Florida. Um, in fact, uh, close to me, I have Lakeland and there's a lot of data lakes there, but, but you guys have swamp lakes, so. Um, this, this uh, what I'm, I'm ultimately getting to the end of my kind of topic here, but, but one of the things I really kind of want to leave off on is we've gotten to the point now where we realize that sims are a beast of their own. They're a big hunk of technology and they take up a lot of space and they're very expensive and all these other fun things. And so like all good industries, this turns into a managed service somehow. Um, and so, so this is very popular today is the concept of managed sims um, and managed pretty much anything these days, but, but we'll talk about managed sims. And, and so your, your MSSP, your MSP, your, your managed security service provider, um, if you have a friendly one in the area, um, may be you know, knocking on your door and saying, hey, look, if you're having trouble working with all of your data, why don't you outsource your SOC to us. Let us be your eyes on glass. Let us put together our, um, our solid list of different things to look for and, and alert on. And, um, and we'll, we'll let you know when we see something bad, right? Um, and Mike, yeah, you're, you're absolutely right. Uh, SLAs uh, are very important, right? Service level agreements. And there's a lot of contractual stuff that goes into this stuff. Um, and again, uh, there's pros and cons to every decision when it comes to a SIM. In a managed sim, there are some pros, right? You don't need to have the internal internal SAF counts. They are monitored 24 seven, well, some of them are. Um, and if you have a, a, a regulation that says that you need to be eyes on glass 24 seven, and you're not in the position to hire a night staff, this is a great solution, something to consider. Now, yes, uh, there's a lot of people that will speak poorly of a managed sim provider. And, and I've, seen, I've seen them do well, and I've seen them do not so well and have room for improvement. Um, and so again, these are always things that you want to consider as part of your discussion and part of your architecting plan uh, when you're taking on the challenge of uh, deploying a SIM within your organization. And so that kind of gets to the end of my rant about SIMs and the education and the history. So I wanted to now kind of open this up to any questions or discussions. But first off, what do I, Jonathan Singer, do with a SIM in my personal life? Um, well, for one, uh, uh, Bitcoin is through the roof. So I monitor my, uh, my mining rigs with a SIM. In fact, I use Sumo Logic as shown here, uh, and I monitor my systems uh, for hash rates and uptime and, and their efficiency. So I use a SIM to make sure that I am making money. Um, 
so that's it's it's really cool. Uh, and this is you know they generate data like and I process the data. No, Sumo Logic's not on Pi four. Uh, that's a separate thing. So the Pi four uh, is uh, for another project that I do uh, called the Corelight uh, software sensor. I recently published a YouTube video uh, about it. Um, and uh, I, I installed a uh, network IDS tool, uh, Zeek, formerly known as Bro, uh, from Corelight on a Raspberry Pi. And it sits on my network uh, and passively monitors uh, all of my data and gives me like a really nice IDS readout. And I pump that data to Humio in the cloud. And so I actually have multiple SIM, cloud SIMs uh, for my house. Um, uh, it, it gives me great uh, visual insight into my data um, and it's extremely valuable to my day-to-day -day operations. And this is just me on a personal level, right? Imagine what it could do for your organization when you get creative. Now, one of the magical words that was uh, brought up earlier was uh, SOAR, right? And, and so there's this new, again, we're constantly developing here. So SOAR is the hot new thing. And that's security orchestration, automation, and response. And this is the idea of saying, well, Sim, um, you have identified a security event based off of the following characteristics that you've programmed into us. What would you like to do about it? Under normal circumstances, the Sim will maybe email you, maybe send you a text message, um, maybe order a pizza. Uh, it's a thing, don't ask. Um, but, uh, but now we've gone to the next uh, level and we've said, okay, well, what if we can have the computer perform the triage also? And SOAR receives that request from the SIM and then performs an operation or an action based off of what we call a playbook. And that playbook may be, you know, disable a user or trigger a password reset or quarantine an email because it has a malicious attachment, right? And so, so suddenly we're going from informational analysis uh, and making the human uh, handle the response. And we're now making the computer automate uh, certain steps or processes in that response to the point that we can um, improve our response time, right? And we can improve uh, our need for, for hiring more staff, if we can automate certain tasks and make people more efficient, right? And so there's a lot of massive benefits that come in when you pair a good SIM with a good SOAR to the point that you can now really start to uh, react and respond to security incidents, um, especially if you just have tasks that you do and repeat over and over and over again. Uh, you have to automate, you have to program in those responses. You cannot waste your time with every single time, uh, you know, there's an incident that you, you do the same seven things. Well, you know what? Make the computer do those same seven things for you and save yourself an hour, right? Because that will start to add up. And so that's a fantastic new industry that is, um, that is coming up. Uh, and and I, I suggest everybody, you know, dig in and, and, and check it out. Um, but that kind of covers my talk for today. And I really, like I said, want to kind of give people an opportunity to throw some questions out there. I know there were some questions in this section over here and it's been scrolling by, but some of it had to do with costs and estimations. Uh, and so a lot of that has to do with um, things that are just more specific to um, your organization, right? And things that are more specific to how you operate as far as things like budget, Right, in-house staff currently versus uh, hiring potential, and um, uh, but uh, things like if you're a cloud or if you're on-prem, and I mean, there's a million questions that really go into it. Now, there isn't like a rule of thumb that says for X amount of an organization you should have seven security people. Right? It's it's just simply it's not that simple. I've seen massive organizations have one or two security people, and sometimes it goes well, and sometimes they just spend all day struggling. Other times I've seen mass, uh, small organizations have a lot of security people and they just spend a lot of time looking at data all the time and they're not automating it, right? Every situation is different. Um, and it, the, the biggest challenge is first establishing that you can you have a budget in place. Again, security is important, but it's also expensive. And uh, talent is also expensive. 
And so making sure that you are capable of looking at those logs and working with the software and working with the systems and making that data make sense. Huh, I brought back the title. So um, uh, along with that, um, were there any other kinds of, of questions uh, from, from, the, from the gallery here? Uh, on, on the screen. I, I, I want to be able to kind of give you my uh, two cent um, opinion on different things. Uh, my words and my opinions are mine and not that of my employers. So hello. And George, did that answer your question as far as uh, FTEs and headcount? While he's finding the mute button, um, you know, I'll, I'll kind of just corporate show myself just a little bit. Like, look, it's, it's a complicated question. Um, but it's worth the discussion of whiteboarding and just kind of looking at what you have, where you want to go, and what your goals are, and how you're going to get there. Uh, and oftentimes, that's just a conversation, a half-day session uh, with a consulting company or, or a trusted advisor, if you're already working with one, um, about uh, where, you know, how, where do I go from here? How do I build maturity in my security operations center? Uh, and what does that maturity look like and how do I measure against uh, it for success? So it's, it, it's just a, a lot of it in the beginning, is just a lot of questions and a lot of, a lot of talking, um, but that will lead to a, a, a solid fundamental solution. So Jonathan, I did have one question about the SOAR feature that you brought up. So I've, like I said, I've had my internship where I've kind of gotten my feet wet with a lot of things and I've been lucky enough to you know, kind of access the dashboards of the uh, logarithm dashboard that we have. And I believe from my understanding that logarithm actually does have a built-in SOAR feature. Is, is, that becoming yes. a, is that becoming a trend amongst most seams that they're building it into? Yes, yes. So, so um, there's, there's a couple different abstract markets that have been kind of built around the SIM and are now becoming part of it. And one of them is SOAR. And so adding automation uh, and that response component to a SIM is becoming more streamlined. Most SIM companies are either acquiring a SOAR or developing their own in-house. And so like Logarithm, um, they're, they're all kind of making it part of the same tool set because it, they just they go really well together as far as connected data. The other big thing that you're going to start to see as part of a SIM is UBA. I didn't even talk about that, but user behavioral analytics, which is um, reviewing trends of, of activity over periods of time and then determining outliers based off of that information, right? And so if you badge into the office and then go to your computer and log into Windows and check your email, and you do that every day, nine to five, Monday for Friday for months and months and months, and then all of a sudden out of nowhere, three o'clock in the morning on a Sunday, your computer is accessing um, a website and you didn't do all those prerequisites, right? You didn't badge in at the door and it's a weird hour in the day. The software will basically say, this is an outlier. This is an anomaly. This is a problem, right? And so that concept too is now getting baked into the SIM um, as one of those triggers, right? As one of those uh, things that the software is looking for to then alert on and let you know and then determine what the next steps are. And so um, Dogarthon is a fantastic tool and it's great that you're getting exposure to it because it has a lot of capabilities. Um, and like a lot of its competitors, it, it's fantastic. And, and that technology and that skill set can apply in all the other different key places too. So keep it up, Kevin. I appreciate Question. that, Jonathan. Thank you. Okay, so for the Sims tools, which ones do you think are the best for having out of the box analytics where you're not having to pay professional services to build out um, searches? So um, you, yeah, uh, and to kind of dig deeper into your question, you're asking a little bit more about what's the, are there better turnkey SIM solutions yes. rather than ones that require a series of, of effort and hours to really kind of get off the ground? And yes. Yeah, and even, even going into that where the company that's selling the tool is not saying here, we developed the script for all these other companies that do this exact same thing, but we have to charge you to do that same script. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there's there's all different types of perspectives, and I'm not really going to try to throw out any big names here because I do uh, still uh, want to keep this a little bit abstracted. But mm -hmm. um, anybody in the magic quadrant will just say uh, they uh, there's certain aspects of of most sims today that have a turnkey ness to them. Um, more of the cloud ones are are a little bit more turnkey because at least the infrastructure is done for you. Um, uh, again, uh, 
they're, they're going to have a series of correlations or what they're called that are built in. And it's just going to be what uh, they consider is important security events that you may find in a variety of different data sources. And then from there, um, you can add more uh, or you can subscribe to more. Um, some of the cloud sims also do uh, kind of like a knowledge share behind the scenes. So if some people are finding a lot of use in certain correlations, it may just be propagated to all users as part of your service. Um, uh, also, additionally, uh, if your SIM is a little bit more isolated, um, you know, you have to bring in those correlations where if you have a SIM that's more internet connected, yeah. uh, it may receive what we call like, think of like virus definitions for yeah, your but SIM. Let's, and that's actually thinking about that. You know, this tool, SIM tools have been around for a while. Yes. A lot of products have been around for a while. Yes. So a lot of these products have these standard data sources or categories that you're going to be pulling into your SIM tool. So why aren't those currently standard out of the box for most SIM tools? Uh, there's a, a variety of different uh, answers there. For instance, not all SIM tools are SIM tools at heart. Uh, one of my initial slides is that Splunk is not a SIM. Uh, because Splunk is a data analytics platform. You can use it as a SIM, but you can also use it for a lot of different things. Human mm -hmm. for instance, is not a SIM, um, but you can use it as a SIM. And so some of these tools may also be multi-purpose as data analytics platforms or log retention platforms um, and data lakes uh, versus uh, that true SIM by definition, right? And, and again, um, a lot of SIMs have uh, some aspect of turnkey to them and a pre-built catalog of correlations. Um, it just really depends on the maturity of the organization. And um, they're also just maybe pay to play uh, yeah. correlations. And uh, again, it, it's, it's a cost risk analysis, right? There may be a bigger upfront cost for some of these and they have a, a wide variety of correlations, but none of them really apply to you versus ones that are really cheap up front. And then you can kind of pick and choose which correlations are interesting to you. So, uh, you know, again, a lot of it comes down to a discussion uh, because it's an organization thing, but um, more of the cloud ones you'll find uh, have a better turnkey experience when it comes to built-in correlations and the continuous deployment and, uh, mm -hmm. of new correlations. Okay, thank you. Absolutely. I, I'm sorry I wasn't able to like throw a name out there, <laughs> um, but uh, I'm really easy to get a hold of uh, at my organization. I'm on Twitter and on the internet. And so if you have a question uh, or if you're already working with a, a trusted advisor consulting company, please, you know, just that's, you have to poke. You always have to ask lots of questions. So okay, that, that's definitely more of a business conversation that we can have outside of this. Okay. Hey, Jonathan, can I ask you a question? Yeah, absolutely. Eric. Yeah, sure. Could you give me an example of like a SIM versus a store? Like may maybe just, I, I was thinking like any specific vendors that are particularly separated because I've always <laughs> assumed that they were like packaged together. So so here's a cool one, right? Is, is that like a relatively new thing? That they're so doing? The, the packaging together is is a newer thing through acquisition. Um, but like there are definitely still stores out there that are just stores, right? Uh, for instance, there's companies like Simplify and Swimlane that are just a store, right? It's just That's just what they are. And they uh, integrate with all the SIMs, right? They hit up IBM and HP and Splunk and Logarithm and they said, hey guys, I want to connect to your software and I want you to be able to trigger me for a playbook, right? And so there are truly organic uh, SOAR applications in the market uh, and just as much as there are truly organic SIM applications in the market that don't have a SOAR baked in, they just partner with some of the other ones and offer a really easy API-based interconnect. Oh, I, I always assumed they were like packaged together for some reason. Yeah, it's right. good. We're almost at that point within the next couple of years where a SOAR is going to be standard with a SIM, um, but we're not there yet. And we're still also just going to have SOARs that are independent. Um, there's a massive game in the market right now about who's buying who. Acquisitions are big right now. Companies buying up other technologies to integrate them. I mean, it's, it's an ever evolving market, right? And SOAR and, and uh, you know, again, uh, Shane, uh, we used to call them Perl scripts. <laughs> so it's, it's not that it's new technology, just like SIM is not a new technology. It's a 40 year old technology. 
Um, we're just giving it a new name, we're branding it, and we're turning it into a web interface API instead of it's a classic terminal of how we used to handle things. So everything old uh, is still there and, every, and it's becoming new again. So just, uh, it, you know, these they're going to they're gonna try to bundle and offer as much uh, into one platform as possible uh, to the point that it just becomes bloated and then nobody wants it anymore because it's too expensive. All right. Uh, would you compare like the, the UBA to like some sort of like heuristics based detection like anti and like certain antivirus programs? So heuristic, okay. So antivirus programs operate in two methods, right? They have uh, definitions based and then they have heuristics based. Um, but uh, just keep in mind at the end of the day, like a UBA uses AI and ML, right? Artificial intelligence and machine learning, uh, AKA math. Uh, no short word about it. It's math. Um, and when uh, it's, it's literally just a set of conditions that identify standard deviations. And that's what you have to keep in mind when it comes to UBA is a system that's developed to keep track of a certain data point over a period of time and identify when that data point goes beyond its expected boundaries really that's what it is at the end of the day and and good on developers for putting that into a piece of software and making it extremely accessible because i'm no data scientist by any means uh but this puts the ability of data science into everybody's hands uh also uh tensorflow could you could you go over what you have on your pi floor again because I was, I was interested in that uh, so if you go on YouTube, I posted a video the other day of a little project with Corelight and it's called a Corelight software sensor. Um, and uh, it looks like I'm the third result, but at least that's from my uh, advertising statistics. Uh, but Jonathan Singer is my YouTube channel. And what it essentially is, is it's, a, it's an IDS software. So an intrusion detection system that is uh, passively listening to all uh, traffic on my network. So I actually put a uh, port mirroring system on my network between my modem and my router. So basically all data that's going from my modem to my router out to the internet is duplicated over to the Raspberry Pi and analyzed by software and broken down what all of that data is seeing and doing and identifying. And it kind of just puts it on like a nice heads up display for me of what's going on on my network and who my network is talking to and what it's talking about. By the way, you're the, you're the second search result for uh, me, just so you know. Ah, that means my SEO is working. Yeah. Uh, if you press the like button, uh, it'll help the Google and YouTube algorithm. No, uh, yeah, like for the algorithm. Like for the algorithm. Don't smash like you want to smash? Yeah, oh, so smash like, that like, like button. Yeah. Like, subscribe, and hit that bell. Yeah, I, I, I don't care about the bell, but whatever. I'm not monetized. Um, but yes, that, that'll um, give you some insight. And um, I put a, there's a blog post that I linked in the comments that explains from Corelight what that project does. Um, and if you're interested, you can actually participate yourself. It's really cool. All right. Absolutely. So I, I have a quick question. Um, I'm just kind of getting started with securing our platform and we have um, some Ubuntu instances running in the cloud. Um, should we use like an intrusion detection system along with a SIEM or? I mean, so security as a whole, like security in the enterprise has many different facets, right? And uh, oftentimes when I'm talking to somebody about enterprise security as a whole, I kind of I kind of take a step back and I say, well, think about your organization, right? What are all the different ways the organization can be compromised? Uh, what are your attack vectors, right? Do you have storefronts where somebody could break in and steal a computer? Do you have a website where somebody can hack it? Do you have databases? Do you have partners and vendors? Do you have cloud hosting? You know. What, what are all the different systems that are critical to you and how you operate in all these different venues? And so, so yes, you should have an IDS, but you should also have a firewall and you should also have endpoint security and you should also have a VPN, right? Um, between your locations and you should also be using encryption. Uh, and so, so security is, yes, you should be performing good security, right? And the SIM is what ties it all together Right? The SIM is that centralized location where all of those sensors and all of those nodes and all of those listening points kind of come back into one middle place to give you the insight and to give you the opportunity to, to look at the organization from a single pane of glass. 
Okay, okay, perfect. Yeah. So I, I personally run an IDS in my house, but all enterprises should have an IDS. <laughs> okay. Okay, solid. So Jonathan, I'm gonna ask kind of a loaded question here because it's something I haven't really been able to dive deep into. Uh, kind of where would you start uh, in the, where would you start configuring alarms for your scene? That's a great question. And so um, one of the things that Michelle brought up earlier was, you know, what, what correlations can come with them, right? And so I would definitely start with what your SIM provides to you already as correlations out of the box and then make whatever little adjustments from there that are pertinent to you. But realistically, yeah, you need to identify what's considered critical within your organization and kind of work your way down. And so in a SIM, oftentimes you'll build what's called a, like a risk matrix. And that's built off of things like what we call assets and identities, right? So those are the two major critical components here. So assets are the systems themselves and identities are the usernames, right? And so to put that into a matrix, you have to ask yourself, okay, well, administrator accounts are very high risk, right? And um, a high risk asset is maybe public facing systems or um, my backup server or where my encryption keys are stored, right? Or the CEO's laptop, right? And so, when you marry those two together in an Excel spreadsheet, for the sake of it, what it that's all it really is, um, the idea is your X and Y columns are your assets versus identities. And you basically say, well, where is my highest risk exist within this organization? And that's how you really start to build up a SIM is by saying, I need to know when administrator accounts are being used or a new member is added to an administrator group, for instance. But also equally as important, I need to know when my critical infrastructure servers are offline, when, um, uh, and in worst case scenario, marry those X and Ys together, I need to know when an administrator account logs into a critical infrastructure system. That is of the highest alert, right? And so, so understanding risk is one of the most important things you can do for your organization when it comes to determining what to do with your SIM, right? And if you can um, learn to measure risk, you will be uh, effective in security. Yeah, that's interesting. So then you're not necessarily just using your SIM for, as a security tool, you're just, you're really utilizing it as the full logging tool like you kind of were talking about earlier. And you can kind of use the logging. It, yeah, it was just a good, uh, unique perspective. I never looked at it that way. That's Absolutely. Neat. And when you're setting up and when you're building out a SIM, those prerequisites are part of that process, right? What are my assets and what are my identities and which ones do I need to keep an eye on, right? Um, and, and you may think to yourself, okay, well, administrators, when administrator, when somebody's using an administrator, kind of, you know, that. well, like, that, that you're correct, the, your intuition and your instincts of what you think security is are what you should be, what your SIM should be doing for you, right? Um, and, and building from there, right? Again, every organization is different. So you may need to just identify certain things that are specific to you and make your SIM yours, right? Make your SIM tailored to the success of your organization. Um, and so, so there's this, there's the turnkey out of the box stuff. And then there's the, the really taking it to the next level, but that, that process of, of sock maturity takes time. It takes a lot of time. It takes a lot of effort. And it also takes, um, you know, uh, sometimes it takes money and, uh, it, it, sometimes it takes outside help. I mean, there's a lot of things that go into a good, uh, mature sock. I appreciate that, John. Thank you. Absolutely. And so when you say outside help, are you thinking of things not only like uh, managed service providers, but outside help in the sense that if you're managing your own SIM, are you, look, are you recommending things like um, absorbing sticks and taxi feeds and other threat intelligence into it to help um, flag off of uh, indicators? Yeah, absolutely. And I, I generally work off of a, a, a six level SOC maturity perspective. Um, and I'm not going to get into detail of what that full thing is. Again, that's more businessy talk, and we can talk afterwards if you're interested. But the idea is, is levels one through three is getting that data in from all the systems across your network and normalizing that data and making it searchable. 
and then bringing in uh, correlation. So something like sticks, taxi feeds, threat intelligence, and also identifying uh, high risk assets and identities. But then four through six, right, the, the, the truly immature levels is integrating stuff like a SOAR and a UBA to really automate a lot of the security processes and then take it to the real next level where you're starting to do genuine uh, security research in-house and you're building out your SIM tool uh, that's specific to your organization beyond what it maybe was originally designed for. So stuff like that. So cool. Any other questions or fun things like that? Uh, I got a quick question for you, John. Sure. So the, the, the setup that you have at home, uh, just, you know, for, for my curious sake, what kind of interesting things have you kind of detected or played around with that to you felt that it was worth, you know, the whole setup and experience um, building up that system? What, what kind of things have you gotten out of it? So, so yeah, I have a couple things uh, at home that uh, I really like to nerd out with, right? Um, so first off, I, uh, I'm built on a ubiquity infrastructure. So having a technology platform that allows me to retrieve logging data and has stuff like syslog built in is the first step, right? And so can you get the data out of your network? Can you get your devices to talk, right? Because they have a lot to say. And then the second trick is, okay, now that you've got them talking, where do you put that data? Um, and uh, some of these cloud sims, oh my gosh, yes, I love your, your, your UAP. Um, so, uh, so I use a combination of both Sumo Logic and Humio, uh, mostly because uh, Humio is actually free for the most part, like at a very small level. Uh, and so is, uh, kind of Sumo Logic, and also Splunk's technically free at a very small minimal level too. Uh, and so I take advantage of a couple, some of these uh, professional logging platforms and pipe my syslog data from um, not just my network devices, but also my computers themselves. So my myriad of Raspberry Pis are all sending syslog data to my sims. Um, and then my mining rigs are, um, I have some custom log parsers on them to read from the software that's running on them. And that's also being sent off. Um, and then the, the core light IDS network sensor um, is also uh, generating what we call Suricata data. Um, and that is, uh, and, and bro IDS Zeek data, and that's being sent off too. And so when you bring a combination of all that information together, you really start to, to you know, not just like um, look at it from a security perspective, but there's a lot of things I have fixed. For instance, I was having some issues with my dynamic DNS in my router and it wasn't updating my IP properly. Uh, and I had no idea this was a problem until I started looking at the logs of my router and realized that uh, there was some kind of communication error with my dynamic DNS service. And I had to, and I went back and fixed it. And I would have never known, right, until it was too late and I was out of my house and I tried to connect to my VPN on my phone and host not resolved, right? Uh, and so that's just a great example right there of where looking at your data uh, and centralizing it um, isn't just a security play, it's also a functional play. Uh, every once in a while, I can diagnose when one of my access points is acting up because ubiquity is not perfect by any means. Um, uh, I can uh, simply monitor my logs on all of my Raspberry Pis without having to walk up to it and plug in a monitor, or I don't even have to SSH in because all the logs are sent off to one centralized web place. So really, it's it, it's it's just like a, it's a peace of mind uh, and the insight that any um, network engineer, uh, system administrator, security, you know, analyst uh, could really appreciate. And so uh, you already have all of the tools most likely within your house. Uh, you don't need to have high-end equipment to do any of this stuff. You just have to have the, the willpower and the ingenuity uh, to do the research. I say another interesting use case for it too is uh... You know, keeping an eye and, and seeing what exactly your IoT devices are doing on your network. Uh, Absolutely. You know, what are they leaking? Um, yeah, that, that was the next thing I was going to kind of allude to is other than the academic use, right? 
Uh, have you seen any foul play from private companies? Any data leakage, sensitive stuff that you caught leaving your house going to corporations? No, I can't say that I've had like anything like that. Um, no, no, like, hey, where are you going? Kind of, no, no, none of that. Um, but what I do find interesting is that sometimes I have found um, that my network is more chatty than I just assumed, right? Than I expected. It, uh, it, it definitely, um, I, I connect to a lot more places than I thought. Uh, and it's not just my computers too, right? I, uh, my wife's computer uh, and her work laptop is communicating with all over the world. Um, and, uh, you know, I'm, I'm doing a uh, cryptocurrency and that's communicating with all over the world. Um, and so it's pretty cool. I, I have some geo location blocking built into my router. Uh, and so I, I uh, in, you know, I, I specifically block uh, countries that may potentially be participating in unwanted, uh, you know, cyber activities, but um, it's it's just an interesting, good insight. Uh, you'd be surprised uh, what your what your stuff talks to in the middle of the night. Um, I found that Amazon Alexa uh, sh uh, is very chatty uh, and and transmits a a load of data. I mean, a lot and of data worse. for an IoT device. It it's I had no idea it was transferring gigs a day. Yeah, that, so the Alexa devices, and since Amazon owns it, right, the Ring devices are very chatty as well. So uh, Ring is now, usually at the top of my list. Yeah, uh, it's usually at the top Especially and, because I've got an extender, and the extender itself is really chatty. Yeah, it's, I do have an IoT network architected. Uh, it's, it's a separate SSID, um, a separate subnet, and uh and so again, that's a networking thing that if you want to go into that, you know, start your research and you'll find that you might be pleasantly pleased with, with segmenting your potentially dangerous items from the rest of your computers. But, um, but uh, you know, just like at home in the enterprise too, you want to know if, yeah, if I, you know, let's say your organization only does business within the United States, then the rest of the world doesn't need to be accessing your resources, right? If your customer base is only in a specific place, why do you need to allow connections from Russia and China? It, it's, it, it's unnecessary. Uh, and so, uh, but, but then again, if you have a business purpose, be my guest, right? Set expectations, manage your risk. Uh, but yeah, that's, that's, that's my thoughts. Yeah, so that, uh, thanks, John. Yeah. I, that uh, so that switch I was showing. So if you want to do stuff like what John's talking about, as far as creating a, a mirror port or port monitoring, is uh, yeah, is grab a, a basic managed switch. He's got the D Link. I've got the Netgear. It's about I think I just bought two more the other day. About forty nine dollars I think right now um, for these, and you get the capability that you can watch all the traffic going across it or most of it because you know you can probably eat up the, the mirroring port uh, bandwidth by trying to capture everything, but it'll give you a good picture. Absolutely. Yeah, that's that's um, that's that's the thing. And that's just, again, that's just for the IDS component. Um, but I think everybody should definitely consider how they can start looking at all their data within their home and then, you know, expand that to the workplace. Wait, Mike, do you have to have like a $50 managed switch? Because I have like a $20 right regular switch, I guess. So the trick with managed is that you can configure it to support um, port mirroring. An unmanaged switch doesn't natively support port mirroring. So this uh, clone of his Netgear is an unmanaged switch. And so you can't tell this instinctively to send the data from here to duplicate it over here like you can with a managed switch. Uh, because you still want the net. So uh, in my video, I, I put a logical diagram of what my network looks like. But the idea is uh, modem from ISB in one port of the managed switch out another port to my router. And so it's essentially in line. And then the last port 
uh, runs off to the Raspberry Pi, and it's simply just listening. Yeah, I, I have a lot so, of so yes, that's... stuff right here. <laughs> yeah, so yes, there's a, there's a difference. There's a need for it. Uh, in the old days, you could, just grab a, you, could, you could just grab a hub, and because you know the hubs, all ports are transmitting it, all information at the same time. You know what? Hubs are like great for like random stuff like that, and port, we port got pass. rid of hubs, but we call them uh, we we call them passive span ports nowadays, or we call them like taps, mm -hmm. right? But but a hub is fantastic when you want to listen. Yeah, and you can use a um actually you can use one of those little um Ethernet throwing stars to also passively. Excuse me. <laughs> oh, you just look it up. Eric's interest. <laughs> look it up. It's called a, a land tap throwing star. It's it's a really cool little gadget. But the idea is, is you put it in line of an Ethernet cable, and it basically gives you kind of like a, a passive side listening port that you can plug in and uh, activate your promiscuous mode. Hmm. Yeah, and, and even outside of that type of investment, I mean, if you've got an extra Pi laying around or, or an extra x86 device laying around. You know, install Pi-hole and, and Pi-hole will give you monitoring of your DNS and watch what your systems are calling in DNS. A lot of times you can find out uh, information that way about your, what's on your network as long as it's calling uh, DNS through your servers. Unlike you know, like the article that Daniel posted on our Slack about uh, there are definitely IoT devices that are hard coding uh, their DNS so that they bypass your internal DNS uh, filtering. And uh, in that case, you know, you find that you can put in rules into your firewall that will actually force it back through your own DNS to get that, to maintain that filtering without it realizing it's being turned around. So I looked up this throwing star or this, this land throwing, I'm not going to get the name right. I looked up this device, right? And it just looks like you just plug in your ethernet cable, you plug in another one and then you plug in another one. So you're like your Pi or whatever. And then it just, it's just like, not, not like a port mirror. It's like an inline port mirror, I guess. It's it's a dumb port mirror, but yeah, that's kind of the top. The, that's the idea behind it. Like I, I have one over here somewhere, but uh, but that's it's a toy. It's meant to inspire you, you know. Uh, explore how networking works, uh, and uh, learn your OSI models, kids. And, and and the star, it's only for like if you're plugging into a line that's running into your switch, it's only going to give you the information that's on that one line. So you're still oh, not okay. going to be able to see the rest of your network. Oh, OK. And that's all I got, I promise. Mm -hmm. Also, hack the planet. Hack the planet. 